All right, good morning. So uh, we are talking our way through blood flow through the heart. Um, and we took a look at the internal structures and anatomical features of the heart. And we've already made our way through blood flowing in to the heart from the inferior and superior vena cava. Just a reminder that this is just where we're starting. But everything that we talk about here on the right side of the heart is also going to occur here on the left side of the heart at the same time. So it's a simultaneous pump, two separate pumps, a left and a right side, but working simultaneously or at the same time. Uh, so where we left off, we had the AV valve that is open and will allow passive filling to occur. So the right atrium fills up, blood enters the right atrium, and it pushes through the AV valve. And this is actually supposed to be a one. Sorry about that. Then the AV valve opens. So as, it's, as blood's pushed through the AV valve, as it fills up in the right atrium, it's going to cause the AV valve to open. And blood is basically just going to flow into the right ventricle. And we don't have any contraction occurring in the right atria. So we're just simply going to call this passive filling. Passive because there is no passive filling. There is no energy being exerted to move the blood into the right ventricle. Okay, so passive filling begins to fill the right ventricle up. And then the atria are going to be signaled to go through a contraction. So the atria signal is to go through the track contraction. The right atrium will contract. And as it contracts, this increases a volume. Uh, I'm sorry, increases pressure in the atrium and causes more blood to be squeezed into the ventricle. So more blood squeezes into the ventricle. Uh, again, this is going through the AV valve, known as the tricuspid valve. Okay, so our tricuspid valve is going to be the gate between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So blood begins to passively fill and then is squeezed in actively as the atria is signaled to contract. And blood enters the right ventricle. Now, from the right ventricle, blood fills up the right ventricle. That signal that was initiated in the right atria travels through the tissue of the right atrium, across the AV node, into the right ventricle. And that stimulates contraction of the ventricle. Now, once the ventricle begins to contract, we have a lot of things that are going to happen here. First, because the ventricle's volume is decreasing, we're going to increase the ventricular pressure. So pressure begins to go up. Now, as pressure begins to go up, the AV valve is going to be forced to close. So increased pressure from the ventricle contracting closes the AV valve. Blood is actually going to be pushed back up towards that AV valve, but the AV valve is not going to open in reverse, which is what we call prolapse. And the reason that is is because as the tissue of the right ventricle contracts, this also includes the papillary muscles. So the papillary muscles contract and they pull on chordae tendinae. And so the valve simply closes and does not close back into the right atria. So we prevent prolapse.
Now, with that change in pressure as the ventricle contracts, the AV valve closes, but the pulmonary semilunar valve is actually going to be induced to open. So blood will enter the pulmonary arteries through the pulmonary trunk. And to do this, we're going to have to push the blood. So the blood is going to be pushed through the pulmonary semilunar valve. into the pulmonary arteries distributed to the left and the right lungs. And as that blood flows through the lungs, as it circulates through the lungs, it receives oxygen and so it is oxygenated. Okay, so from the pulmonary circuit, blood is going to flow back into the left side of the heart. And it's going to return to the heart, to the left atrium. Now, the pulmonary vein, which is where the blood is going to come from, so the blood enters from the pulmonary vein, and the pulmonary vein, again, is going to be just an open vessel, just like the superior and inferior vena cava, there's no valve, so blood just will pour in. And as it pours in, it fills up the left atria, and really what we're going to see is we're going to have an increase in pressure because the left atria is going to begin to fill up with that blood and the left atria has a certain volume and as we fill the left atria with blood, pressure increases and causes that AV valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle to be open. So once that opens, once the AV valve opens, blood is going to go through the left AV valve and again this will be passive filling filling up the left ventricle at the same time that the right atria is being signaled to contract just about the same time shortly after the right atria contracts the left atrium contracts so during atrial contraction, we're going to squeeze more blood into the left ventricle. Again, blood's going through the left AV valve, which we call the bicuspid valve because of the presence of two cusps rather than three cusps to pour blood and push blood into the left ventricle. Okay, so blood's entering the left ventricle. By the way, this is the letter I. And the next point will be letter J. That's not a Roman numeral I if you're just keeping track. Okay, so as we let enter the left ventricle, blood pours into the left ventricle passively first and then squeezed in as the atrias contract. The left ventricle is <laughs> thick muscle tissue or surrounded by thick muscle tissue. It's the thickest that we're going to find in the heart. And so this is going to be able to induce the most forceful contraction that you can experience in the heart. So it enters the left ventricle with its thick tissue muscle and it's about to, the blood's about to experience a very forceful contraction as we squeeze the blood out into the general circuit. And 
Okay, so the ventricles contract, we undergo ventricular contraction, and the blood is going to leave through the aortic semilunar valve. Okay, so blood begins to leave through the aortic semilunar valve. This is forced to open up because of the high pressures that are induced as the ventricle contracts. And through the aortic semilunar valve, the blood enters the very first vessel in the general circulation, which is going to be our aorta. Okay, so out to general circulation through the aorta. Question. Yes. Do you kind of trace when you think you're going to let like the pattern come? Absolutely. Yeah. So in this figure here, these are my inferior and superior vena cava. So blood begins to flow in passively into the right atrium, fills it up, and then the atria, um, they, the, as, as the volume of blood increases in the right atria, our tricuspid valve opens up. That AV valve opens up just because of the larger volume of blood. And so blood begins to passively flow into the right ventricle, filling the right ventricle up. Then the right atria contracts, squeezing even more blood into the right ventricle. And so then we get a full load of blood in the right ventricle. Shortly after the right atria contracts, the left ventricle, I'm sorry, the right ventricle is going to be induced to contract. So we have a signal that basically permeates through this tissue and then goes down and causes all of this tissue to begin to contract. So it begins to contract and as it contracts, the AV valve closes, prevented the prolapse because of the papillary muscles that we find here attached up through chordae tendine. And so the only way the blood can go, it can't go back out this way, it has to go up through the pulmonary trunk. So it goes up through the pulmonary trunk and it gets distributed to the right and gets distributed to the left to go to both of the lungs. And then it comes back in by way of the pulmonary veins, the left and right pulmonary veins. And there's actually two bifurcations as they come back in on both sides. And so the blood pours back in to the left atrium from the pulmonary circuit. Left atrium begins to fill up and as we fill up with blood, it's going to increase pressure just because there's more blood present, and this causes the uh, bicuspid valve to open up. This atrioventricular valve open ups, opens up, and blood begins to passively flow into the left ventricle. And as it passively flows into the left ventricle, the level of blood begins to fill up. Then we contract the atria. We squeeze a little bit more blood into the left ventricle. Shortly after atrial contraction, that ventricle is forced to begin to contract, increasing pressure in the left ventricle. So then the bicuspid valve snaps shut. Again, prolapse is prevented by the presence of the papillary muscles and chordae tendine. And the pressure induces that particular semilunar valve, the aortic semilunar valve, which is a one-way valve, can only open up really into the lower pressure aorta to squeeze blood or push blood out into the aorta, which leads into the general circuit. And then it would circulate through all of our capillary beds, all of our other major veins and arteries and vessels, and returns back through the interior and superior vena cava. Yes? Can I ask a dumb question? There is no such thing as a dumb question unless you're going to ask me for ice cream. No. That would be a dumb question right now. Okay, so you know how on the superior and superior vena cava, it's called the superior vena cava, and then the inferior vena cava, or like, nope. you just go to like, feeling? So the inferior vena cava, all of the vessels that are connected to the inferior vena cava are going to be lower body. So there's basically a drainage from your toes up to about the level of the bottom of the heart through the inferior vena cava for the most part. Superior vena cava is going to be attached to everything that's above your arms and your head and your neck. And so all of this drains down through the superior vena cava into the so it's, coming in both ways. it's coming in both ways, yep, from the top of the of the body and the bottom of the body, yes. Okay, so I understand like how 
Yeah, so how is the heart actually going to contract? Yeah. What's going to be the consequences of the volume of blood in the heart? How much, how much blood is actually going to be in the heart? We're going to talk about all of that. Sorry, yes. one more question. So, like, those are not happening at the same time, right? Like, the, the right ventricle and left ventricle filling at the same time? They fill up almost at the exact same time. So, that's just like a heart right now. Yeah, and you've heard heartbeats before, right? Love, dub. Uh -huh. Love is your atrials, atria contracting. Dub is your ventricles contracting. So it's love, dub. And we're going to talk more about those heart sounds. We're going to talk about the pressures that go alongside those heart sounds. We're going to talk about the conduction of, um, of the electrical activity that induces the contraction. We're going to go over all of that. I just wanted you basically to see how blood flew th flowed through the heart. Now we're going to put more physiology behind it to talk about inducing the muscles to contract. What are the consequences on volume, on pressure, all of those things? Does the, the blood that is being pushed from the aorta cause the blood to be pushed back through the heart? So is that, is yeah. That so basically the question is, do we have a high pressure side and a low pressure side? The highest pressure in circulation is in the left ventricle. The lowest pressure in circulation is in the right atrium. So you have a circuit that starts out where we increase pressure here, and that forces blood into the general circuit. And as you move further and further away from the left ventricle, the pressure gets lower and lower and lower. So you've all measured pressure here on the uh, brachial artery. Basically, we occlude or block the brachial artery with pressure from a, um, a blood pressure cuff, and then we can see at what pressure does blood flow uh, basically start back up, right? The pressures there that you've experienced are 110 to 120 on the high side, which is happening during left ventricular systole, which is ventricular contraction. So at the arm, the pressures are 120. If we were to take a transducer, and we can actually do this in experimental settings in the lab, we can insert a transducer, a pressure transducer, and go all the way back up into the left ventricle and measure pressures there. And it's above 120. It's higher than 120. So if you were actually to take pressure down here in the leg, or even like one of your toes, if you had a tiny little toe blood pressure cuff, you could measure the <laughs> blood pressure there, and it would be a lot lower than 120. As you move further away from the heart, the blood pressure drops all the way until you get to the right atria, these giant veins, the superior and inferior vena cava, and you're at a very low pressure. And we know, because we've already talked about this, that pressure always wants to go from high pressure to low pressure, all the way through the whole circuit. Well, the reason that you're doing that is because it's a, it's easier to take the blood pressure on their ankle or to and to measure their pedal pulse because it's you can you can feel it better, um, their pulse at least, and it's it's just easier to take the blood pressure on their leg. Um, yeah, it would be different. Is it different from a baby too because they have less? In the like, baby, dog, blood yeah. like pressure. Yeah. Right, 120 over over 80 is the normal for adults. Heart rates are very different as well. Your heart rate normally is 60 to 75 beats per minute. A baby's is in excess of usually 120. And that's just because of body size and the things that are going on. You know, I mean, we we talked a little bit about. The fossa ovale, the, uh, that spot in the heart that is normally open to allow blood to move across. In all reality, it may not totally close up until after birth. And so to compensate for that, a higher level of heart rate, some of the blood goes this way and doesn't get oxygenated. Most of it goes, goes this way from ventricle or atria to ventricle and out the pulmonary trunk to get oxygenated. But they compensate with a higher heart rate to make that more effective. These are all really good questions, and over the next couple of days, we're going to address all of them um, because those are certainly very important for cardiovascular physiology. But before we can do that, 
I want to talk just a little bit about the heart and its own circulation. Okay, so you know that there's a general circulation that goes to all of our different tissues. And you know that there's a pulmonary circulation which brings blood that's been deoxygenated into the lungs so, lung so it can be oxygenated. But the heart also is tissue and it also needs to be supplied energy and oxygen and have waste materials removed. And it's not as simple as just, well, the heart is being exposed to blood all over the place. Because this is deoxygenated blood on the right-hand side. So are we just going to forget about the, the uh, needs of the right side of the heart? Well, no. In reality, what we're going to do is we're actually going to have blood that is going to circulate through the whole heart in a coronary circuit. So we actually have a third circulation mechanism that we need to talk about, or a third circuit that we need to talk about. And that's how the heart tissue is, at, is going to be oxygenated and given nutrients and have waste products removed. We call it the coronary circulation. And the figure that you're looking at here, you can see that we basically have made the heart tissue itself ghost, or it can be seen through. And you have in red the arteries that make up the coronary circulation, and in blue the <laughs> veins that make up the coronary circulation. So to get into this... The coronary circuit is important because the heart tissue itself is required to have nutrients and oxygen and also waste removal, right? We got to be able to bring nutrients and bring oxygen and then remove wastes. And the way that we accomplish this is through coronary circuit or circulation. So the coronary circuit, which is going to be the blood supply for the heart, at rest we're going to supply about 250 milliliters per minute to this coronary circuit. Okay? Now, in percentage terms, what is this? This is about 5% of the total blood supply. So, really, at any given time, the blood that you have, 5% of it is going to be within this coronary circuit. Okay, that may not seem like much, but I want to take it in relative terms. Because in all reality, if you look at the heart and the mass of the heart, it's only about a half a percent of total body weight. And I'm going to abbreviate total body weight just as TBW. So we have a really small organ taking a large amount of blood. So this coronary circuit is going to be really important. And part of that reason, part of the reason here, is because we got the heart doing so much stuff. It's basically continuously contracting. We've already said 2.8 to 3 billion heartbeats a, a, in a lifetime. And it's happening at 60 beats per minute every second. At 75 beats per minute, more than every second. So this is a very active tissue. It's generating large amounts of metabolic waste and requires large amounts of oxygen and large amounts of nutrients. So we're going to have a pretty big blood supply uh, as a percentage of the total body weight of the heart. Okay, so at the base of the aorta, and you can see the aorta right here, right at the base where it leaves the left ventricle. <laughs> on the anterior side. Blood is being distributed to the general circulation and it is also going to enter into the coronary circuit through the left coronary artery. We 
which is frequently referred to as the LCA. So to get into the coronary circuit, we basically begin to spit blood into the general circuit. A lot of it goes out to all of the other tissues in the body, but 250 milliliters per minute are, is going to enter into the left coronary artery at the base of the heart on the anterior side. Uh, we're also going to distribute that 250 milliliters or some of that 250 milliliters into the right coronary artery, which is not too far away. So here is our left coronary artery here. Here's the right coronary artery here. Both, both anterior to, uh, on the heart. Now notice the LCA is going to distribute blood to the left side of the heart. The RCA is going to distribute blood to the right side of the heart. So in all reality, we kind of actually have two different coronary circuits, a right-hand coronary circuit and a left-hand coronary circuit. But we just simply, for uh, all intents and purposes, just refer to the whole thing as the heart's circulation, the coronary circulation. Okay, so left coronary artery is supplying a lot of blood to uh, some very large tissue because it's distributing blood into the left ventricle or the tissue of the left ventricle, which is very thick. The right coronary artery supplies blood to the right atria. I guess I should say right atrium. And to the SA node, that conductor path, uh, the uh, pacemaker, conductive pacemaker for the electrical activity inside of the heart. So why is it called the coronary artery? Coronary just simply means crown. And so this is the crown of the heart. And you can see how it basically sits here and encircles the heart sort of like a crown. So we're just simply calling it the coronary artery because it's the crown of the heart. All right. So the right coronary artery, we're supplying blood to the right atria, we're supplying blood to the SA node. There is much more detail on the left coronary artery side of things. The LCA is actually going to bifurcate, which just simply means that it's going to split. So you can see here the left coronary artery enters or passes here towards the left, and then we have this bifurcation. And we have one of those bifurcation that remains anterior on the heart and another one that wraps around posterior. And you may not be able to see it real well here, but we're running kind of along the margin of, uh, of the heart and then also in, in kind of lighter colors back behind what you can see here, there's blood supply that sort of wraps around posterior to the heart. All right, so LCA is going to bifurcate. And that bifurcation, uh, we give rise to the left anterior descending branch. Uh, that's the only time I'm going to spell this out. Because it's too long to spell out always. The left anterior descending branch. which, by the way, goes by another name as well, can also be referred to as the anterior interventricular branch. So this left anterior descending branch, the LAD, is typically what it's referred to by lazy biologists supplies both ventricles and then the anterior portion of the septum. So you can see anterior interventricular branch or the left, uh, in, I'm sorry, the anterior descending uh, branch of the left coronary artery right here. And then we're going to have our second bifurcation that's going to give rise to the circumflex branch. Now the circumflex 
artery will give blood supply to the left atrium and then to the posterior portion of the left ventricle. When I'm doing, when you know, I'm saying like, like a nurse, like you oh, just like oh. write it out. Honestly, I really don't know. I've never had to chart. I don't really. I mean, I know basic charting mechanisms, and I think that they're supposed to be pretty specific. Okay. Um, but I don't have to deal with that. So on my smart board <laughs> in my classroom at True McCollum College, I will just continue to abbreviate because I'm a lazy biologist and that's what lazy biologists do. All right, everybody good here now? All right, uh, going back to the right coronary artery, the right coronary artery also has a bifurcation. And that by <coughs> excuse me, that bifurcation <laughs> that bifurcation is going to give two new arteries. One of them is going to be the right marginal branch. The right marginal branch is going to supply the lateral right atrium. And then also the lateral right portion of the ventricle, the right ventricle. So I'm, I'm really hoping that you're understanding the following that when I say supply, I'm saying that these large vessels break down into smaller and smaller things like arterioles and then capillaries to supply each individual cell or one or two individual cells the blood and oxygen and nutrients and waste removal capabilities. Okay, so the second part of this bifurcation is going to be the posterior interventricular branch. Posterior interventricular branch. And this is going to supply posterior side of the ventricles and the posterior portion of the septum. Now again, supply means eventually we get down to the level of the cell in a capillary bed. That's where exchange occurs of oxygen and nutrients and waste removal pro or waste products are removed in the capillary bed. And then that capillary bed gives rise to the coronary veins. And so on the other side of this circuit, we're going to have blood drainage through cardiac veins. So blood drains through the cardiac veins. Now, there's actually going to be two different places where we're going to have some of the vein, uh, or I mean, some of the blood drain. There are going to be small Thebesian, 
sure I spelled this right. I'm not quite spelling it right. Small Thebesian veins. And these will collect up some of the blood. In, in all reality, it's a very small portion of the blood. But very interestingly, this blood that's collected is going to be returned directly to the right ventricle. So blood collected by the Thebesian veins is returned to the right ventricle directly. And this, again, is just a small portion of the blood that's in the coronary circuit. What about most of the other blood? Most of the remaining blood is going to actually be collected by larger veins in the coronary circuit. The blood that is in the anterior portion of the heart is going to be picked up by the great cardiac vein. So this is anterior heart. And so you can actually see this great cardiac vein here. This is the anterior view of the heart. This is our great cardiac vein here. And you can see it's actually going to uh, make its way behind to the posterior <laughs> side of the heart. And it's actually, eventually, we're going to connect into um, the, uh, we're going to connect into the right atria here. So great cardiac vein drains into this really large structure here. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. It's called the coronary sinus. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. So that's the blood from the anterior portion of the heart. We also have a posterior interventricular vein, which shouldn't surprise you that this is going to be posterior portions of the heart. We're also going to have a left marginal vein. And this left marginal vein is going to pull blood from the lateral portions of the heart, the side of the heart. So lateral portions of the heart. Now, all three of these main drainage vessels are eventually going to make their way to dump blood into this thing called the coronary sinus. Okay. And you can see the coronary sinus right here. It's this sort of large structure. Now, what exactly is a sinus? A sinus, the term sinus, is basically refer, uh, referring to the fact that it's a collection space or duct. So all of the blood gets dumped from the coronary circuit, or most of the blood from the coronary circuit gets dumped here into the coronary sinus. So the veins empty the blood to here. And it'll actually collect that blood up, and then it will allow the blood to enter into the right atria. So this is actually sort of like exactly what the inferior and superior vena cava are doing, emptying blood into the right atria, but it's coming from this coronary circuit rather than the upper general circuit or lower general circuit. So blood into the right atrium. And again, this coronary circuit exists because this is the way that the blood and the heart, I should say the heart, is going to be given nutrients and oxygen and have waste removal capabilities. Okay, so that's been a lot of anatomy. 
now we need to start talking about cardiovascular physiology and really heart physiology to begin with. And I want to start with the process of beating the heart. So how does the human heart beat? How does a mammalian heart beat? Mammals, including humans, have a heartbeat that is considered to be myogenic. Now, if you take a look at that word, you're going to see myo, which you already know relates to muscle, and you're going to see genic, and when you see genic, you should think genesis. So myogenic means that this is going, the human heartbeat is going to originate in the muscle. So the human heartbeat originates in the heart tissue itself. So in order to understand this, we have to understand a little bit of the microscopic anatomy of a cardiac muscle cell. Now, some similarities to skeletal muscle, some differences as well. The really unique thing about this is each cell in a heart actually has the capability to beat on its own. So each heart cell will beat on its own. So not only is it myogenic, not only is the heart rate originating in the heart tissue itself, the muscle cells that are responsible can beat on their own. This is a phenomenon that we refer to as autorhythmic. So the heart's autorhythmicity is going to originate in the heart tissue, and it's going to be, in a lot of cases, self-sufficient and it can control its own its own rate. So what are the consequences here of being autorhythmic? There's actually some really cool things that uh, come out of being autorhythmic. Um, so if we were to take a heart and we were to break apart all the extracellular matrix, so we just had cardiomyocytes left over, and we were to put them onto a Petri dish, and we were to observe them under microscopy and give them the right salt solutions and all that so they can continue to be, what we would see initially is all of the little cardiomyocytes would be beating on their own. And they'd be beating their own rhythm. So there'd be no real uh, organization or what we would call sensational. And they'd just be beating. And you give them a little bit of time, and pretty soon they would be beating all together. All on the same rate. And so, I mean, literally, it looks like they're all just sort of going through the motion together, like a flock of birds. So that's a really interesting characteristic, and it's really important that we understand why that is. And part of it's because it's autorhythmic, but part of it is also because muscle cells, cardiomyocytes, are really good at communicating with each other. So let's talk about these cardiomyocytes. You have a picture here, um, got a micrograph, and then you got a couple other uh, artist renditions of cardiomyocytes. And what you should notice is that there's some similar features, some similar things that you've seen with skeletal muscle. We have myofibrils with their striated appearance and sarcomeres. There are T tubules and sarcoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria present inside of cardiomyocytes. One of the major differences, though, is cardiomyocytes are much smaller than most skeletal muscle, and they only have one nucleus. So we don't have a multinucleated cell any longer. They also interact uh, with really unique um, uh, cell to cell signaling. Uh, um, regions inside of the cell, things like gap junctions, and also anchors to help hold individual cardiomyocytes together. Most of these exist 
in this region. You can see it here outlined, and you can see it better here on this figure. That's called the intercalated disc, and it's basically the interface between two individual cardiomyocytes. Now, we have gap junctions present there that allow mixing of the, extra, uh, the intracellular fluid between neighboring cardiomyocytes. And so anything that happens in one cardiomyocyte, say this one here that's been dissected, this cell neighboring it is going to immediately know what's going on. So if this heart cell here contracts, this heart cell here is probably going to immediately follow because of the mixing of the intracellular fluid between those two individual cardiomyocytes. So kind of get this down in your notes. Cardiomyocytes, again, rather than being multinucleated, they have a single nucleus. They are still going to have a striated appearance. And again, due to the molecular presence of actin and myosin in organized as myofibrils. So yes, this means we actually could define sarcomeres, Z-line to Z-line within a cardiomyocyte, just like we could do with skeletal muscle. Then we're going to have this really unique cell-cell junction called the intercalated disc. So we're going to be joined, each of our cardiomyocytes is joined to a neighboring cell. And a lot of times, as you can kind of see in this picture, this cell here, is joined to this cell on this side, it's joined to this cell on this side, there's an interaction here as well from uh, this portion of the, of the muscle down to this portion of the muscle. So we actually have this organized network of interactions, all of them through intercalated discs. Okay, so through our intercalated discs. And by having these present within the tissue, this provides both mechanical and electrical junctions. So both mechanical and electrical junctions. So whenever we have any sort of mechanical movement, such as contraction, that contraction is relayed, and the movement of that contraction is relayed to the neighboring cells, to other cells nearby. And then the electrical changes, which where are we going to get electrical changes from, by the way? How have we gotten electrical changes in other systems? Nervous system, skeletal muscle. We saw a movement of ions across the cell membrane. So anytime we have ions moving across the cell membrane of a cardiomyocyte, those electrical changes are also picked up and relayed to other cells. So this cell-to-cell -cell junction through the intercalated disc makes communication between individual cells really, really good. So that experiment within the Petri dish, we put all the cells in there and they begin to contract together, is due to these characteristics of the intercalated disc and the gap junctions that exist within the intercalated disc following the mixing of the electrical signals. So if sodium levels change in one cell, that can be immediately transmitted to neighbor, the neighboring cells. All right, so I got like one more minute here, so I'll just give you the cliffhanger for the day. Next time I see you, on Wednesday, we'll pick up with the conduction system of the heart, okay? And basically, the conduction system is going to come down to very well-organized, specialized cardiomyocytes to transmit a signal throughout the heart. I want to also remind you that you do have your first exam coming up in just a couple of weeks here. February uh, 13th is when the exam is going to take place. And we are really well on track with 
lecture material this semester, so I don't anticipate that there's going to be any changes in what uh, chapters will be covered on that first exam.